All right, everybody, good morning and welcome. And before we get started, I just wanted to ask everybody to please silence your cell phones or any noise-making devices. And if you could please just remember that after this to fill out the, uh, the electronic uh, speaker evaluation forms, that would be killer. So thanks for coming down today. We appreciate it. I know Friday morning is sort of a, <laughs> it's a tough period for most people. We're really, we're really happy that you guys could make it, and we appreciate it. Um, and just to get things started, I'm Chris O'Neill, and I was uh, a senior level designer on God of War 3, and I work at Santa Monica Studio. And my name is Bruno Velasquez. I'm the lead game animator at Sony Santa Monica Studios. Um, we are really honored uh, to be able to do this presentation with you, our peers. And I just want to say that even though there's only two of us up here, this was truly a team effort. And, um, you know, we're just honored that we are able to represent our studio. And we also wanted to thank GDC for approving this talk and letting us come up here and share this with you. So, as the title suggests, this talk is about the Titans and it deals with level design in God of War 3 and creating the spectacle kind of landmark sequences that we had in that game, which were the Titans, Kronos, and Gaia. So using Kronos as a specific example, we're going to go through the entire development process from the beginning to the end and really outline the tools and technology as well as the philosophy that enabled us to kind of create the sequence in the you know, from the beginning to the end and kind of how, what, what our process is, how we achieve this stuff. Um, but before we do that, I wanted to just kind of just talk about a couple of things and just dispel a couple of rumors or thoughts you might have about us. So us being from Santa Monica Studio, you guys probably think that we're obsessed with violence, that we hate our fathers, that we hurt small animals, and that we engage in these like lavish masked sex parties. And I'm here to tell you that actually none of that is true. Um, the reality is we actually just don't hate our fathers, but... So it's just to kind of give you a little bit of background on who we are and what we're like. So it just kind of fills you in a little bit. Yes, thank you for clearing that up, Chris. I really appreciate it. Uh, so uh, to get things started, we just want to you know, kick it off by showing off this video that highlights some of the moments in the uh, Kronos uh, Titan sequence from God of War 3. Uh, for those of you who might have not played the game, and also for those of you who have, who have played the game, uh, just kind of serve as a little uh, refresher. So let's go ahead and get that playing. So my only regret about that was that it, I wish it were epic. <laughs> so let's talk about kind of a high level on what this experience was and you know, really kind of nail that down. So it's worth mentioning that this was the, the biggest undertaking that as a studio we had ever attempted to develop. Not only literally, but, only for, but, not only literally, but also from an organizational standpoint. Just the manpower alone, the amount of time, effort, resources dedicated to this was far and away uh, unrivaled in our studio's history. We had the, uh, the nice distinction of being evaluated as the number one IGN boss battle, which was interesting for us because this was never really intended to be a boss battle per se, but nonetheless, we were really happy that that was uh, embraced in that fashion. The next thing worth mentioning is this is kind of a million dollar money shot, and by that I mean it was just, this is a 25 minute sequence, and you know, the amount of time, energy, and money invested in this in order to deliver on something that's really about 1 20th of our game um, is pretty extreme considering.
The other thing worth mentioning is this is a five core team developed kind of process. And what I mean by that is it consisted of me as the level designer, consisted as an animator, Jason Hall. It consisted of a combat designer, Adam Poole. It consisted of, uh, let's see, Tyler Breon, the character artist, and Gary Cavanaugh, the technical artist. And three of us were dedicated to this full time from the beginning to the end. Um, also, even though we had five core team members, the total amount of people that were involved at the end were uh, 35, which uh, is about a third of our studio at the time. The animations uh, that required for this character were approximately 420, which were uh, more than any other character that we've done, except for Kratos himself. Also, the, the joint of the, the count of, of joints for the characters was like 500. Um, he was comprised, his mesh was also extremely um, complex. Uh, he had 160K uh, triangles and about 18 million polygons. Um, the average time, as Chris mentioned before, was uh, approximately only 25 minutes out of a 10-hour game. So it was really just a, you know, it was a huge undertaking, but it really, was, uh, as a whole, um, the amount of playing time wasn't uh, as, as big as the entirety of the game. Also, the character, this was the biggest character we've ever done. He was approximately 500 meters tall. So we've never really done anything with that scale before. And so let's really talk about the kind of inspiration for this and where these ideas come from. And you know, Albert Einstein said that creativity is knowing how well to hide your sources. And you know, game development is certainly no different. You know, oftentimes things are borrowed from other projects. And at the beginning uh, of development of God of War II, the God of War II director, Corey Barlog, had a vision to create God of War's version of the Shadow of the Colossus, which is another an interesting Sony game that came out several years ago. And that kind of set the precedent moving into the third one of how we were going to start that. If you watch the, you know, the end of God of War II, you know that it ends on the back of Titan, the Titan guy on this big cliffhanger moment, which later gets picked up at the beginning of God of War III. And so, you know, that kind of taking that idea and figuring out, well, you know, and sharing with you guys, well, how do we actually achieve those moments? What is our process for, as a studio, for, for embracing doing these kind of high-impact games that, you know, really can be kind of these uh, insane spectacles and, and ultimately very challenging? So... The Santa Monica Studio development philosophy is essentially that we always start our games with a bang. That's number one. It's that we really want to grab the player from the very beginning by the throat, almost literally, and say, this is what we're going to be showing you for the rest of the game. Here's how we're going to start it. You know, there's no cool up. You know, we don't, there's no cinematics, really. You know, there might be a little one, but it's just right into the gameplay. You know, it's just boom, you're in it. And if you look at God of War 1 through 3, it's, it's always the case. And we feel as a studio that we have much more of a chance of doing something uh, exciting and something that the fans will appreciate if we think huge and really are kind of unrestricted about what we're going to try to do on a, on a level as far as feasibility and, and what's achievable. And we just kind of go balls to the wall and figure out what's possible. And then we feel that after that, we can wrangle it in and we can, we can condense it down from that rather than starting small with what's manageable and expanding outward, which we don't feel works very well for us. The other thing worth mentioning is that we play test a lot. And I can't emphasize that enough. You know, there's no secret that these games uh, are released and they, they have high review scores, in, at least in our experience, is because we play test our game probably 12 times externally during the development process, which can range, range from you know, anywhere from two to three years. And internally, on any given level or boss fight, we probably play test it between 40 to 50 times, sometimes more per level per, or boss fight, depending on what stage of development it's in. So you can see that there's a lot of eyes on this. We don't develop things in a vacuum. And the next thing worth mentioning that ties into that is that my belief and my experience working at the studio and learning from this team is that great, ma great games are really made one piece at a time. You know, if you, have an, if you have an intro that's rated a 9 or a 10, and then you have a, you know, a, a puzzle after that that's a 9 or a 10, and then you have a boss fight that's a 9 or a 10, you, know, you have a game that's a 9 or a 10 all the way through. And it's, it's very obvious, but it was something that became kind of new to me seeing that in practice at Santa Monica Studio. One thing that I'm grateful about our studio is that there's a um, commitment to quality all the, way from, all the way from the top. So management really you know, gives us free reign to, um, to, tr to be creative and to push ourselves and try to make uh, the best game possible. Um, also, uh, th we've, we've had some great directors on the God of War series, Dave Jaffe, Corey Barlog, Stig Asmussen, uh, and they've been the gatekeepers. You know, uh, everything, every decision is made through them. Um, everything from you know marketing pieces, everything to the music, they really, really, really um, have a, a grand vision for for the game, and that actually really helps us to get things done because we don't have to make decisions necessarily uh, through a committee or, or or through a publisher or anything like that. And um, you know, although we do 
uh, provide a lot of feedback as a team uh, to come up with ideas, but in the end, we have uh, that one person that really uh, makes the hard decisions. Um, also, our studio is, is good because we specialize. Um, uh, like Chris mentioned before, we have a combat designer that focuses only on you know, making sure the AI feels good, making sure that Kratos feels responsive, feels great. We have level designers that focuses only on levels and the moment-to-moment -moment events that happen in the levels. Um, we have people that just focus on character modeling, environment modeling, uh, so it's very, very specialized, and I think that helps us to, to really focus on, on, on the things that, are, that we really want to push and really sell. And it's a, it's a good way of, of, of approach a scene like, like the Titan. Um, also, we don't like to play it safe. You know, we try to kind of go for something that we're not really sure if we're going to be able to pull off. So then by the time that we finish it, uh, we hopefully still have something that, that was pretty grand. And so at the beginning of God of War 3, the God of War 3 director, Stig Asmussen, you know, he set forth to establish the vision with the team and, and really to figure out not only where the game will take place and, and what are the lo locations and the, and the kind of grand moments, but also you know, leveraging the previous moments from, the, the, from God of War 2 and really trying to and, you know, create those within God of War 3 and the Titan moments specifically. So let's, let's just talk quickly about you know, establishing a vision for our games. What does that mean? So when we set out to create our games, generally... The entire studio will spend a month or so or, you know, coming up with ideas, submitting ideas to the director uh, you know, regarding locations. And so our locations can be anything from ideas like, I want to go to, I want to, go to the future, I want to go to Egypt, you know, let's do something in, uh, you know, in the Stone Age, like, whatever, it doesn't really matter. Um, but if you look at God of War 3, our key locations in that game were, uh, were Olympus, were, uh, let's see, Hades, and the caverns and the labyrinth were kind of the key locations. And so it really gives you kind of the diversity of the, not only the visual landscapes that you're going to be traveling, but it just gives you a good pacing and to understand the tone of your game. The next thing we really focus on is defining what our epic set pieces are. And, you know, that's very important for us. Because if you look at God of War, there's a lot of, you know, throughout the game there are many iconic kind of locations that you'll visit kind of frequently throughout your experience playing through the game. And in God of War 2, uh, another senior level designer and, and that works at our studio, Jonathan Hawkins, he had, uh, using this image, kind of came up with an idea from you know, the movie Cube to kind of create a sequence in our game, which ended up being the labyrinth. So that's another idea as well, is to kind of establish those set pieces. And then lastly, we really work on establishing what are our wow moments? What are the things that are really going to anchor and, and brand the player in their brain? And kind of the things that they're going to remember you know, two years from now, a month from now, ten years from now, are those things that you know, really cement it in their mind. And we think about those three things. And that's the kind of holistic approach that we take in order to establish what our, what our game is. We don't, we don't define our game by story. We don't define our game not by story. But we generally define our game in terms of what do we want to do? What is the most compelling thing in terms of locations, set pieces, or wow moments? And the director will distill these ideas down and filter them through him. And he'll ultimately make the final decisions. So part of establishing the, uh, that early vision also is, is, is the previous, you know, getting... Uh the art team and the concept art team to start developing some inspirational pieces of, of the scenes that, that we really want to go for. So this particular one here is showing off uh, the chrono sequence and Kratos um, you know, running around on his arm, kind of setting the tone, setting the scale, and it's really, really a, a good platform for us to jump off and, and start exploring about how we're going to actually get this done. Um, next thing also is doing a lot of um, storyboarding, uh, especially in the more complex sequences. Uh, this is just a really cheap way for us to get something down with the director and start flushing out some ideas of what perhaps uh, the sequence could, could entail. Um, so it's very important for us to do this sort of stuff. The next thing we want to share with you is this video. This is a pretty cool uh, previous video that we did. Um, we took God of War 2 asset, uh, assets. We actually grabbed the, the Cyclops and we just scaled them up and we started parenting all these uh, environments on them. And it was just barely, it really a, just an early way for us to start kind of wrapping our, our heads around how we were going to do, what sort of things were going to occur on the Titans. And, uh, you know, at this point, we didn't have any, any tech or anything at all. All we had just old assets. So we just started, you know, kind of putting things together to, to get things rolling. And what's great about that is that you can, you can really kind of prototype something very cheaply without having to actually build any art or tech or anything really other than things you already have. And it's a huge saving grace for us because you can, you can sell that idea immediately to the team and to yourself. So let's quickly talk about the brainstorming process. There's a lot of different philosophies and a lot of different people have, in studios have different ways of doing it. Uh, the way we do it at Santa Monica Studio uh, seems to be effective for us. So I thought I would just touch on that really quickly. 
Um, generally, when we kick off a brainstorm, the director will come into a meeting with the design team, and he'll submit a photo, usually, or you know, a, a high concept. And in this case, the photo would have been something previously that we had shown, which is that high concept vision for, for Kronos. And so the team is essentially tasked at that point with, with three criteria that they need to define as a group. And so one is getting on it. Well, what, how do you get on it? What do you do? Do you, t do you, what, do you fly a plane and do it? I mean, do you, you know, do you go to a Chuck E. Cheese and then like he picks up the Chuck E. Cheese and swallows it? Like wh whatever, like how do we get on it? What do you do there? Like what is the, what is the, the thing that you're, you're doing when you're on the creature? And that's very important as well. And then lastly, how do you get off? Do you kill it? Do you drown it? I mean, does he, is he your buddy? Like what happens? Do you guys go to McDonald's? I mean, I don't know. So you gotta just kind of have to figure those three, three things out. And then the third thing is that the team will break into groups, or individually rather, for 30 minutes, at which point you know, we'll go read Wikipedia or try to come up with different concepts and jog our brain with ideas. And we'll basically write all those down within the criteria framework and we'll bring them back. And we'll regroup and we'll put it on the board. And that's a pretty gnarly process and it takes a lot of time, but it's very valuable because you get a lot of ideas and it's a huge smattering of different ideas. And then at which point the director and the leads will take that, that list and they'll evaluate that privately and they'll figure out you know, what are their favorite three within that list. And that group of maybe six to eight people We'll get together and they'll ask his popularity, which actually is totally a typo, but I just left it in there because I thought it was kind of funny. <laughs> and um, designer spelling, you know, we're super good at it. And uh, at which point then we'll figure out and assess the popularity of it and, you know, it'll probably get distilled down to a few, at which point the director will make the ultimate decision on which ones he wants to put in the game. So it's a very democratic process that involves a lot of people and we find it to be very effective. And, leveraging the, the cohesive kind of team brain rather than the individual brain, which is one way of doing it, but we find the strength in numbers is very important. So you know a little bit about our philosophy, a little bit about establishing the vision in our studio, and a little bit about the inspiration, but let's talk about the research and development, because this is not something that was, was very easy for us to do. We didn't have the technology that was in place in order to pull this off. There was a lot of new things we needed. So first and foremost, See if this is there not cooperating. Is. So there we go. There go. Um, initially, we didn't have the ability to attach a character to a mesh and move the mesh around and have the, the character respond. So, uh, Fabrice Odero, one of our senior programmers, basically who works on our navigational system, he created a dynamic state transition system that would allow any AI or player character that, while moving, the environment around him would respond dynamically to that. So that was a huge element in terms of selling the, the dynamism within that experience. So that when players are playing through it, they really feel like I'm on this creature. I'm not just like standing on a, a static object. So next, this is our gray box man, which was the initial iteration of the Titan as soon as it loads up. Um, basically, it's, uh, it was just a quick way for us to get something, just start animating something, starting trying to figure out if this guy is going to be walking on twos, on all fours, what is he going to be doing in the environment, how is he going to be attacking or interacting with Kratos. But this way, uh, it was just something really cheap and dirty that we could do. And the nice thing about this is that we were able to get this guy into the game and start actually prototyping and getting creators to attach to him and climb on him uh, in a very, very economical way. Uh, the next thing is, uh, you know, now that we had this gray box, man, we wanted to iterate and, and start fleshing out what the character was going to look like. So this is the cinematic model from God of War 2. So we were able to strip that from the cinematics that were actually high rendered, that were uh, a separate model than the one that was actually used in the game. Uh, and we were able to just quickly take that and start adapting it and start getting into our, into our new engine. So that was a huge, huge uh, savings of time for us. So you all know this, you know, you make games, you design levels, it's very obvious that you, usually you're working in a static environment. Like, yeah, maybe your levels will change or something a little bit, but generally it's a, it's a static medium. And the big challenge for us was that, you know, we built this on a real creature. This isn't faked. So how do we do that? That was the, the, the initial super challenge for us to achieve was actually getting all of our in-game kind of scripting logic and our in-game entity system uh, that controls our cameras, our level scripting, uh, our sound, and everything to actually exist on the player. There was no way that we could do this without having a system created that would allow us to attach it to the creature. So Matt Arrington, one of our senior tools programmers, basically built us a system along with our tech art department that enabled us to attach specific, uh, any game object that we wanted within Maya to specific joints that were defined on the creature. And so as you can see here, you have, um, you know, everything in red is kind of designer entities and scripting and everything in, in, uh, in green is for the camera team and everything in blue is for sound. 
And so that as the character moves around like this, those objects from the T-pose would also match the mesh and the position that he moved in. So this is a, a hugely important part in actually selling this experience because if we couldn't have all of the actual information within the game following the character, there was no way we could achieve this without it being a cinematic. And so I'm sure you're wondering, well, okay, that, that's all well and good when you're in a T-pose, but unfortunately the game isn't played like this because if it were, it would be pretty bad. So what we ended up having to figure out was, well, what happens when the character is moving? So if the character you know, is in an animation, then what do we do? And the big problem with that was that you know, immediately going from this to going to this or anything, all those game objects that you had at a specific kind of orientation within Maya would just shoot all across the level. And it became super nightmarish for us to try to build this way. And so what we ended up having to do was to basically to create a, uh, a preview animation system that TechArt created for us, which allowed us to play animations and to see where those specific game objects would exist within the creature itself. And this is, I can't even emphasize how annoying this process was in the long run. It was the only way we could do it, but it just takes forever because for all 400 animations that you have, you have to check that each specific object that you need is in the exact right location at any point within the animation timeline. And it just is, you can imagine how much of a nightmare that is. And it, it, this thing, there's no secret, this thing took, you know, several years to develop. So that kind of gives you an idea of kind of how we achieved that. And the most important thing is that, you know, really em emphasizing in this video is that we could not have actually done this sequence without this technology. And the next thing that we had to do was to create a new collision system. And so uh, Vasily Filipov, our lead programmer, and Jim Tlander, a senior programmer on our team, uh, essentially created us a system that enabled us to put collision on a, on a meshed character, on something that wasn't like a kind of a primitive, a primitive geometry. And as you can see here, we kind of have, uh, we have the arm of Kronos, and you know, the green is the run, and the, in, in the red is kind of like no-slip stuff. And the important thing about that is that we had gone from a, a studio that could basically move around primitive shapes that we called CD hulls that could be animated, but they couldn't be very dynamic or, very, or really stray too much or have too many polygons, um, to, a, to a system that enabled us to animate a mesh in the same way we would animate a creature and to attach collision to it. And so as you can see here, Here's Kronos as his actual, like, whatever million, 50 million or whatever polygon. I don't even know. It's, it's out of control. But we could never put collision on a creature like that because the amount of just, you know, faces on a creature is just it's too crazy. So there was no way to do it in that fashion. So this mesh was actually just a visual component. There was really no collision attached to him. And what we ended up doing was, in the same way you'd have, like, armor pieces, we had specific instance versions of collision by region that we would turn on and off throughout you know, the sequence. So we would define it by hand, by stomach, by arm. And it was the only way we could do it without crippling the power of the PlayStation because if you put collision on a character that big, it's just not going to run. So this is the way we were able to achieve it and it was definitely a new system for us. So this video showcases a combination of, of like the three months of uh, research and development that we did. Now we had uh, you know, a, a, an actual model uh, in an environment we had Kratos fighting enemies. Uh, he wasn't uh, completely falling off. He was able to nab on him. And we had some kind of rough animation blocked in. All right, so we've talked about all that stuff, the tools, the technology, the philosophy, et cetera. And now how do we sell it? This is an important thing. And so from the very beginning, the mandate was, well, we can't just create this kind of like magnificent like idiot robot. Like this needs to be legit. This needs to be like an actual creature that you feel you're having an interaction with, that, that emotes, that lives, that breathes. You know, it can't be... You know, we can't spend two years developing something and just have it be overseas. So we really need to focus on how we sell this experience. So the first mandate that Sig uh, gave me specifically, who was our game director in God of War 3, was this thing needs to be alive. We have to bring it to life. If it doesn't feel alive, we're totally screwed. So how do we achieve that? How do we bring this thing to life? And the first thing we really tried to create was the emotional buildup. So if you play through this experience, you know, from the beginning, Kronos is rather, you know, amused with Kratos. He's kind of holding him on his thumb laughing at his grandson, and he's basically like, oh, whatever, you know, you're, you're a flea to me, I don't care about you. You know, you blind him, he gets irritated, you land on his hand, you break a sore, now he's like, he's kind of pissed off, and then you proceed forward, rip his fingernail off, now he's furious, he's, you know, he's, he's angry, he's like, what you, you know, what are you doing, you're like ripping my fingernail off, I gotta, I gotta kill you now. And so he goes through this kind of dramatic kind of character arc, and through that process, you know, he ultimately is defeated and he goes through these kind of agonized stages where he's becoming progressively more and more disturbed and defeated. And so you really wanted to try to achieve that in, in telling that story for the character. The next thing was we had to really keep this believable. You know, yes, it's Greek mythology, yes, it's, it's fantasy, but we came at it from the perspective of how would a man kill the giant? 
and we felt that if we could anchor it in that context, then it would feel more interesting and more believable for the player in the context of God of War. So that was very key to us as well. The next thing is dy dynamicism, which actually isn't really a word, but it's just kind of something we throw around at Sony Santa Monica, and it's just really is the dynamism aspect. It's making sure that you know, we have those moments where the character throws his arm out and guys, you know, grunts are falling off and falling into the abyss, or, you know, or rocks are falling, and that the character is moving and you're changing states. You really had to bring that, and we really had to sell that. So the animation early on, when we, pit when we pitched this idea, we knew that it was going to be critical to sell um, the, the emotion and to sell the progression of the battle. And as well as you know, dealing with a, an actual moving level, we, you know, we hadn't really done that before. The visual effects were also going to be a critical part. You know, um, all the sequences in which Kratos interacts with him and begins to slowly kill him or uh, do damage to him, we knew that the visual effects had to, had to be spot on and had to really uh, complement the animation, as well as uh, the sound effects and the, and the VO. Um, you know, it was important for us to, to have this sort of dialogue in, in, in place so that he could kind of have a back and forth with Kratos. So it wasn't just, uh, you know, some soulless creature that, that didn't have any feelings or emotions. We really wanted to make sure, so that's why it was important for us to, to fit as much dialogue as possible throughout the sequence. So here we have Kratos, you know, men love him, women want to be him, whatever. And he's seven feet tall, roughly, on average. Then we have Hades, who's about uh, 20, 25 feet tall. Then we have the Colossus, who is, I can't read that, but he's pretty big. And this is actually the real reference size of how this would be in the real world. You have the Empire State Building now next to the Colossus. And then finally you have Kronos, who comes in at about 1,600 feet tall. And so you can see the actual kind of scale that we're dealing with here on a character such as this. So we knew, of course, that the scale was going to be critical to, to really sell this, to make this really grand. Um, but in order for us to do that, we also wanted to make him a real character, not just a, a, you know, a set of pieces like one arm here and one, one head there. We really want to build a whole character. And um, this, this really, really, really was challenging, but it was actually in the end, it, it was a big payoff. Um, we also needed to have moments of relative scale. You know, that's why we had enemies running on Kronos and, um, and Kratos interacting with other enemies other than him. We also had to uh, display uh, moments where we can show Pandora's temple that was strapped to Kronos back, which uh, God of War, uh, probably like I think around 70% of the game took, took place on the back of, of Kronos. So we wanted to have, make sure that we included those moments as well as the, the, the moments where you could see uh, Kronos place his hand on the side of the mountain and kind of show a couple shots of, of the ground to really, really sell that relative scale. Um, the camera work was, was also very critical. We, we had to make sure that we had you know, dynamic upshots, downshots. And then that's another reason why we wanted to have a real character in the environment, because there was many, many points where we needed to, to really remind the player that they were on top of this giant character. And the director would say, pull the camera back, you know, way back. And if we didn't have the real character, we would have ran into a lot of problems. So by having this, this guy really being in the environment uh, really, really saved us. Um, also, we wanted to keep it all real time. So uh, we, we really reduced the amount of, of cutscenes that we had during the sequence and the amount of cuts. It was a one uh, consistent camera throughout the, from the very beginning to the end, with the exception of maybe when he swallows you and you go down his throat. That was probably the only time that we really cut. Um, but other than that, it was, it was sort of like a seamless thing. We kind of uh, you know, were inspired by uh, like scenes from, from movies like the opening of Boogie Nights where it's just one cons constant shot going through one scene, of course, without all the cocaine. But, um, you know, we really wanted to, to sell that. Uh, and of course, like I mentioned before, uh, the animation was critical to sell the scale. We needed to make sure that this guy felt heavy, that he felt, uh, you know, grand and, and slow. So it was a special challenge for, for our animation team uh, to really pull it off. And so, Bruno, did a great job and emphasized kind of the sense of scale and how we achieved that. But let's talk about the design decisions that, that were intentionally made from the very beginning. And the, the first thing that we made, um, you know, very clear as a team was that establishing this was an experience and not a traditional boss fight. You know, God of War has a lot of great boss fights. Uh, you know, if you look at Hades, that was a really cool one. Or if you look at the Hydra in the beginning, you know, the, you know we have traditional boss fights that are stage-based encounters where, you know, you fight a guy who's roughly your size at this stage and you do damage and you move to the next stage and you're engaged in kind of a natural combat and a natural kind of you know, narrative and fighting. And in this, we, we were not emphasizing that. You really wanted to sell the experience, not so much a boss fight. The next thing is, you know, that as designers, we're always trying, and level designers as well, we're always trying to show the goal whenever we, you know, 
you know, to the player whenever we're creating our environments. We always want to you know, dangle that carrot in front of their face. And this is certainly no exception. And you know, when we were play testing it, we would ask people, well, what do you think the goal is? And you know, overwhelmingly, the response was, uh, it's his head. You know, it's his head. You see his head, and that's where I'm supposed to go, which was actually our intention. But we were surprised people intuitively knew that. And the other thing that you really wanted to establish was that in addition to having the, you know, the large goal, you need to have those intermediate goals as well. So if that's moving from you know, the wrist up to the, to the forearm you know, and then you know, destroying his fingertip and showing those goals all along the way and you know, presenting them every few minutes is very important for us. And in doing that and then having those kind of you know, intermediate goals and, and long-term goals, we really feel it's very important to, to reward the player for everything that we ask them to do. And it's a, you know, as you, you, know, you move up eventually to his belly and you know, go through this whole sequence where you're, you're, you know, you're fighting a cyclops on his shoulder, you're, you're rewarded with being able to be swallowed by him and go down into his stomach and then break out of his stomach. And you, every five minutes, the player is experiencing something cool. And I, and I really call, you know, kind of call, call God of War kind of a bra on the couch game because I feel that every five minutes, somebody watching you play is going to see something interesting. Whether it's you know, ripping the eye out of, a, out of a cyclops or if it's you know, fighting a titan or whatever it is, every five minutes you really try to give someone a, a big payoff. And the next thing obviously is comfortable pacing. Yes, this is a high impact sequence and yes, it's very tense, seemingly, but we, we couldn't expect the players to be stressed out for 25 minutes, constantly dying, constantly frustrated. We had to create the sense of danger at all times with, only, with picking and choosing very specifically when we were going to actually have it be uh, tense and hazardous. And then lastly, plausibility. And we just really needed to make this have this the whole situation make sense. You know, it's, there were no laser beams. We weren't going to you know, ride a magical unicorn and like, strangle him with an invisible lasso. Like, we couldn't do anything like that. We had to have it make sense. Like, is this justifiable? Could a man kill a creature of this size? OK, so we had our, our research and development. We've roughed out you know, some stuff. Uh, we we, we kind of had the layout of what the events were going to happen. We knew what the goals were. Um, now it was time to actually start executing it, executing uh, the sequence. And of course, Kronos uh, was going to be the, the, the star of the show. So we needed to focus on him, make him, make him really, really detailed. And, and one of the biggest challenges was for um, the modeler, Tyler Brion, the character artist that worked on Kronos, that usually we have a uh, character artist focus on just the characters, and we have environment artists just do the environments. But this was a, a unique case, because we had to tell Tyler, guess what? You're now promoted to environment artist as, a, as well as a character artist. Because at first, we were going to have two different people work on, the, on this character, one for environments, one for character, separately. But we found out that that just wasn't going to work out, because it was like having two people work on the same thing at the same time. It was really challenging. So I think it worked out for us to actually have the character artist kind of take over that responsibility as well. And the next thing that was super important to touch on is that you know, generally, in a level design process at our studio, uh, you know, the designers will work on kind of the levels in isolation from the artists, and we'll kind of build things in Maya and you know, essentially construct our spaces how we want and iterate on them. Um, unfortunately, in this case, we didn't have that luxury because we had to create this in tandem with the actual physical model itself. And so, you know, when you're on top of the hand, as you can, or under the hand, rather, when you're, as you can see in this photo, and Kratos is kind of climbing along that path, and the thing that was very challenging was that, you know, in that ceiling climb state, the creature, you know, would move his, his hand and animate it slightly, and then he would fall, and there wasn't enough fidelity actually carved into the mesh that enabled us to have kind of clean navigational transitions through the mesh. So what ended up happening was, you know, in, in order for us to get that cut properly, it was, it was pretty much a nightmarish process where I had to take screenshots and, as you can see here, kind of draw in and say, I need more fidelity here, cut here, cut here, cut here. And then the character artist, Tyler, would spend you know, an afternoon doing that. And then he would hand that off to uh, our technical artist who would then reskin the whole thing. And that process took about two to three days. So you can imagine just, you know, just assembling that, just the back and forth in that pipeline was just super arduous. But it was the only way that we really could do it at the time. So it was definitely worth noting, but super frustrating. So we're just going to talk about, a little bit about um, sort of the challenges that we're facing in each department. And as Chris mentioned, you know, tech art had to con continuously update this character. And one of the things that we uh, added to Kronos, um, after the E3 demo was well received, there was a sequence there where uh, the centaur got degutted by Kratos and his, you, know, you would see his entrails come out. So the director was really happy with that. And he's like, OK, we've got we to do that in a much grander scale. We've got to put that in Kronos. 
So uh, we had to kind of transfer this super tech that we have developed from a very small character into this really giant, gigantic scale. And uh, that was really, really complicated. Um, also, uh, <laughs> we had, a, as I mentioned before, a massive joint count. Not, not that kind of joint, but, um, <laughs> but you know, we had 500, uh, 500 joints uh, that we had to deal with. So we had full facial animation on the character. We had full fingers, everything that was required to, to really uh, bring them to life. And every time that, uh, as Chris mentioned before, they had to change the path uh, of where Kratos was going to be running, they had to reskin it every time. Eventually, we developed a system where you know we could we could transfer the skinning uh, a lot easier. But early on at the beginning, uh, it was it was it was not that way. It was definitely definitely challenging. Um, and for animation, um, we have never really done something like this. Usually, we animate a character that interacts in in the environment, uh, but we never had a character that was the environment. So we had to definitely uh, figure out how we we're going to do this off, how to pull this off. And uh, because of that, we had to deal with uh, stability issues versus aesthetic issues. And what I mean by that is that, of course, we want to make this guy feel alive, like, uh, like he's really there, uh, and not, not just some animatronic character. Um, but at the same time, we had to uh, keep in mind the, the gameplay. Uh, so we couldn't just have him flail around and move like crazy because, you know, things could, you know, craters could fall off, things could, 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 could break, uh, you know, and, and then that, that, that wouldn't have worked out. So we had to constantly balance that with the sign. All right, does the character feel alive? Yes. Is he, is he moving? Uh, is he not moving too much, just enough so that the gameplay is stable? Yes. And then we were able to uh, achieve that in the end. Um, also, the uh, animation resolution, because the character was so large, the further you got out to, the, to his extremities, like fingertips, the animation would start like, you know, shaking and, and it, it would just start becoming unstable. So we had to deal with that and we had to um, you know, work with our tech art department to, to uh, find solutions for animation uh, compression so that uh, it would be able to work in the end. So let's give it up for Keyboard Cat real fast. And uh, we love Keyboard Cat. And so basically, the level design challenges that we faced, at least for myself, were that you know, I went from basically working on maps and uh, designing levels and then handing them off to art in a kind of traditional pipeline that's governed. You, know, you hand it off, you just assume it's going to get done. Produ we have producers that worry about that. And yeah, you'll interface with the artist a little bit and they'll come ask you questions. Um, but this is very different. In this instance, uh, you know, the level designer myself at the time you know, essentially became the nucleus of this effort insofar as that my job kind of transitioned into also you know, half producer. I was also I was the only person who really knew everything that was going on with this creature amongst a, a massive team that eventually was comprised of 35 people. So, you know, no one else knows. So you, we didn't have a producer on it. So, you know, half of your job is actually doing. The other half is just like kind of task management and figuring out where everything is and who's working on what and when it's going to be ready. So that was certainly a new challenge. The next thing was, you know, you, I literally had to become like one with the animator. I mean, we might as well have just like, you know, had our bodies like sutured together because he was my left hand and I was his right hand because I couldn't work without him and he was basically moving my level around and without us being able to directly collaborate very easily it was near impossible to do anything in a reasonable time frame. So we had to actually end up sitting together just like side by side and essentially it was like stepbrothers, you know, like we were bunk mates. So it just became kind of weird but it was actually super necessary in the end. And then also working, like I said earlier, with the new collision system was, ter it was terribly daunting. It had a lot of challenges associated with it in terms of debugging it and making it work. And then, you know, reliance on other disciplines. And like I said before, you know, traditionally designers at our studio can kind of work in isolation, but in this case, it was being very much tied into the, the animation team, very much tied into the tech art team and the character art team. And like, I needed these guys in order to to achieve what we were trying to achieve. I couldn't do it by myself. And then, as far as camera design is concerned, you know, obviously the moving foundation is a huge concern. How do you camera level when the, when it's moving? So we needed to kind of tackle that and figure that out. And Mark Simon, our, you know, our lead camera designer who did a great job on God of War 3 cameraing the, the, this, this map, sorry, this, this character level, um, you know, I, think he, I think he nailed that pretty well. And then also, obviously, selling a ridiculous sense of scale was super challenging for us. And you know, be, not being afraid to pull the camera in into the detail, but also, like Bruno had said, being able to pull it out. So those are challenges that we face in new ways of designing. So we've talked a lot about kind of where we came from, but let's talk about you know, what, what would happen when we were actually getting it done. So, you know, after the initial research and development phase and that prototype you guys saw earlier, where we were into the development process was Nathan Gary was the level designer on it at the time who had pioneered the technology and 
and kind of taken it in its very early stage. And the goal now was to get it into a shell form, which is essentially um, to take it from the very beginning all the way to the end with our big kind of spectacle moments mocked in. It gives us kind of a rough outline that you can play through. It doesn't have the connective tissue. It doesn't really have anything in it other than, you know, the kill and then all the intro, maybe five nodes of like what you do from the very beginning all the way through. And it's basically just to kind of get like a, a starting outline, a starting palette to, to work from within. But let's talk quickly about that because this is very important for our level design kind of process. We, we, like I mentioned, we use a, a process where we, where we define shells for our levels. And so as you can see here, this is the Hades shell from God of War 3. And what shells enable us to do is to create a continuous mapping and progression of our, of our worlds. And this is the Hades world. Uh, and all the levels that are comprised within that world, and how do they physically fit together, um, not only obviously physically, but also in terms of what is the pacing for each area. You know, we need to have a boss fight here, we need to have like a loading hallway here, there needs to be a puzzle here, a fight space here, and we'll actually go through and meticulously um, you know, spreadsheet this stuff and figure out where are our wow moments, what is the time breakdown of our wow moments, where are our fights, what are the time breakdown of our fights, and create a kind of a spike chart for the entire game, and what, what is it delivering uh, to the player from beginning to end. And so as you can see, it's very effective for us. And we can literally run through the whole game, essentially, in shell form from beginning to end and say, here's a vista, here's a fight, here's a, an epic wow moment. Well, in some of it's very TBD, but it gives us a good understanding. So in addition to that, our design philosophy at Santa Monica Studios, to expound on that, and this is worth sharing, I hope, is that we value experimentation and iteration over documentation. And we do not document. Um, yes, we will write things in like Microsoft Word to pitch and to share. We will brainstorm in that fashion. We will do things in Illustrator. We spend most of our time doing. We spend most of our time building. We don't find that uh, tying ourselves to documentation is very helpful. And in fact, our documents always come last. You know, our, we don't write game design documents. We define mechanics, etc., after they've been designed, after we've iterated on them. And our level design docs are the same. Uh, in fact, we don't even create those anymore. We just do video run-throughs. And we find that we don't we don't marry ourselves to anything because I don't. You know, looking at God of War from the outside before I started working at Santa Monica Studio, I thought these guys were like insane mad geniuses. I was like, well, because I, I came from a world where you design maps on paper and then you have to get it right and you have maybe one shot to do it. And that's not the case. You know, we have the luxury of being able to um, have the time to let things come together and that's very important, you know. The, you know, there's a commitment that, you know, in our studio that you, things need time to come together. You know, it's not, you can't make a, a sequence like Kronos or any of our elaborate puzzles or Pandora from God of War 1 in a week, two weeks, a month, even three months. You know, oftentimes our boss fights take six months to design. Um, our high action moments in our games can take years to build, you know, and it's just about giving it the time and what's, you know, valuing what's important and figuring out where to, where to spend it. Additionally, you know, uh, you know Tim Moss, our, our, you know, essentially our, our tech director, and Krista Erickson, our tools director, are very good about uh, giving us strong tools that allow us to iterate very quickly. You know, like I said before, we can basically build everything in Maya ourselves, and the, in fact, the entire studio works within Maya. There's no, and artists will use ZBrush, but everyone is actually interfacing and working within Maya directly, so it gives us kind of a unified platform to develop from within, and that allows us to iterate very quickly and to build things, and we don't have to go back and forth with art and have them essentially build our maps. We build the maps, and then they art on top of it. Also worth noting is that in our studio, desire, designers are really encouraged to think for themselves. This is, like I said before, it's not a one-person vision studio. You know, it's not one guy thinking of all the ideas and, and making them happen and telling people what to do. You know, obviously, there's, you know, people make decisions, but we all think as a collective unit, and we, we find that that's very important for us in terms of getting a lot of ideas and distilling it down to the best ones possible. And then it's also about getting the right people on the bus. You know, the, uh, the interview process at our studio is, is very painful. You know, we have, a, we have a gnarly test that takes forever for people to give them a week to do that. And if we get to past that stage, you probably have, you know, they're greeted with eight to 10 hours of interviews in a day and they go through pretty much every department. And it's very brutal and it's very agonizing, but we feel that if we can vet our, vet our designers and vet our staff within our studio, then we know that we have people that can handle it and that can do good work, that can be entrusted, like I said before, to think for themselves. And we don't have to manage them, uh, you know, overmanage them and they can create content and they can really just build and do what they do best. And the next thing is really knowing your philosophy and sticking to it, whatever it is, whether the vision of your game for God of War, for example, you know, it's, a high, it's an action adventure game with combat, puzzles, and platforming. And that's our game. You know, we're, we don't build things that deviate from that. We don't, you know, we don't try to build like social networking components within the game. We don't build PlayStation home hubs. We don't do any of that. We stick to what we know and we, and we continue with that. And that works not only on a grand scale for our games, but also on a, 
on a small scale for what our levels are. You know, so for designing the labyrinth levels, you know, we knew that these are mechanical contraption rooms that are essentially hazards, and we don't, you know, we don't do anything unique in there. We don't have, uh, you know, there's no water in there or something crazy. And so we, we stick to the vision and the you know, philosophy of whatever that is, and we, we, we keep that going. And then the last thing you know, is that we really value the strength in numbers. And like I said before, we have, we have a lot of people. We have a lot of people that are really you know, passionate about what they do and that they can contribute. And you know, I, I've worked in a lot of levels at Santa Monica Studio, and I know that um, you know, they've always, always, always worked out better in the long run than what I originally could have conceived. And had I built my initial vision of what I thought a map could be in isolation, it never would have been as good as what it ended up being in the long run. Once you have other people looking at it, you get the feedback from other designers, et cetera, et cetera, and the leads come in. And you, know, you get a lot of insight from different places. And it's very important uh, and to be, for us to be you know, kind of communicative and reciprocative as far as sharing ideas and being honest. I just wanted to quickly touch on the art philosophy um, uh, using this example. So this is a shot from the, uh, the announced trailer for God of War 3. And this was all a trailer that was developed in-house. We, we did everything in the, in the engine. It was sort of a, a way for us to, to kind of test our, our new engine uh, and see what we could pull off. Uh, so we had this moment in the game uh, on the trailer, and it sort of uh, kind of set a, a goal for us to push uh, towards for the final game. And although that moment didn't really occur at the beginning of the game on Gaia, we were able to get that moment into Kronos. So it's sort of that, 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 that goals that we set for ourselves that we want to make sure that we delivered on the promise that we had established with that trailer. Um, also, you know, pushing ourselves forward, um, we just want to make sure that the character of Acronos was the most detailed that we, we could do. So Tyler Brion did a great job on detailing uh, everything from the veins down to, um, to, to other fingerprints. Um, so definitely our most complex character we have ever done. Uh, the next slide shows sort of like a progression. Um, first is the, uh, the cinematic model from God of War 2. And as you can see, the character didn't change too, too much, but there was definitely a, uh, a progression that, that you can see here. We, a lot of iteration, a lot of fine tuning, a lot of detail uh, you know, that added, got added over time, as well as you can see some, uh, some height changes. And it's also worth noting that uh, this is anatomically correct. And uh, Tyler definitely uh, got into some hot water over this. This is a point of contention on the project. Uh, he was told not to do this. He did it anyway. And then ended up making it into the game because it would have been weird because, we, you know, as you fall off the creature, there would have been a lot of crotch shots, and it just would have been kind of bizarre. And it is a bit ironic for a guy so big. He is not so big. So. Someone, uh, and someone, uh, I think at one point, they, they were talking about, like, sex minigame and all this stuff. Like that. Yeah. We were just like, no way. We just couldn't figure out how to make it work. We didn't know yeah. I mean, if you guys have any ideas, <laughs> we'll talk later. <laughs> so at this point in development, we had basically created a shell. Nathan Gary had spent time working with the team, you know, Meng Vu, our animator, et cetera, and uh, you know, basically building this for us with, with Tyler and you know, working from the very beginning to establish the shell. And what we were able to do was put this together, as you can see in this video, from kind of beginning to end. So this is six months into development on the creature we were at this point, and three months after the the tools of technology had been developed. And at this stage, you could play through it. It had all, a lot of the major beats. Um, it wasn't exactly fun yet, um, but you, know, you could see the kind of the spectacle there. There was no connective tissue really built, um, and it was all really kind of mocked in and to be determined. There was really no art added, um, and it was very basic. There was still a ton of work to be done, but at least we had a kind of a, a nice starting point. And as you can see here, that's our hot box sequence. And, you know, we, we kind of have these like weird college humor names that we attach to all of our sequences in order to kind of create like a nomenclature so we can easily reference them within our team and we feel that's helpful rather than being like, yeah, it's the thing where he's like holding the hand. People say, yeah, it's the hot box. Everyone knows the hot box, you know, so, and you go through that and we, we basically do that for everything that we have in our game that's kind of big and requires, you know, a lot of conversation. So that's pretty cool. That's him getting strangled right there. And so, where are we now? So now we have to do it for real. So Nathan Gary moved on to a different position within Sony, and that was exciting for him. And that left a vacuum in order to see who was actually going to finish this thing off. Because, as you can see, it was kind of there in a shell. The idea was intact. It kind of made sense. Um, but we actually had to do it now. And how are we going to do it? So I was actually brought in for better or worse. I was super excited in the beginning. And you know, I, I quickly turned to dread, went to talk to everyone who worked on it to figure out how gnarly this was. And uh, we just got to it, man. There was really no option, so we just jumped in. And I started working on it with the team. And 
you know, I was initially tasked with, with a few things, and one of them was to figure out, well, play through it and figure out what works and what doesn't work. And I, I felt initially the things, you know, a lot of it was working, and in fact, I think it, it was quite cool already, but I felt like we were missing some things. We were missing the dynamism, we were missing a lot of kind of those big moments I talked about where the character transitioned states, etc. And we really needed to shore it up. We really also needed to really create a kind of a, a fight sequence between the character and and Kratos, and really, you know, selling that experience, and we feel like we didn't really have that at that point. So we had to figure out what we were going to cut, what we were going to keep, and what we were going to improve upon. So I just want to share with you a couple of the cut stuff. So uh, this is a, a part where <laughs> Kratos is actually uh, going to, uh, across to each one of Kronos' eyes and just ripping it out and then just having, having at him. Uh, we've, we kind of figured out that by the time that you reach his face, he was pretty much incapacitated. Kratos is a brutal character, but he's not necessarily sadistic. So we, we felt that hey, he should just go for the forehead and just finish him off. But and on top of that, we just had too many eye ripping scenes already in the game. So yeah. uh, the next thing is um, this attack that you know we 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 had for Kronos early on. Yes, Kratos is the size of, of, of an ant compared to Kronos, but this was, attack was just way too literal, and it just didn't work out for the character at all. But I just thought, you know, I wanted to share this with you guys. And so the first thing we decided to tackle was, let's, well, let's just nail this from the beginning to end. You know, it's, let's just fill it in from start to finish. And, you know, we decided to start with the right arm. And this is kind of the right arm at maybe, I want to say, like the pre-alpha stage. And we were, we were kind of figuring out what we wanted to do here and what worked. And we spent about three months just working on this one section. And it was the most challenging for us because this is where we really, really wanted to sell the actual even though this is not like a real boss battle, but, you know, our version of a direct fight between the two of you. So, you know, we have, you know, we have Kronos screaming at you, we have you running over to him and like attacking him. And we had, a, we really struggled with this for a while. And, you know, we were struggling with the transition state from this point to the belly. And, you know, one day I was just, we were sitting there and kind of out of frustration and he said, well, why don't we just rip his fingernail off? Thinking people were going to be like, oh, that's a bad idea or whatever. And everyone was like, actually, that's kind of cool. Let's try that. And so Jason Hall mocked it up that day, the animator, and we just, we tried it and it, it, it instantly sold itself. People were like, that's, that's really, that's terrible, actually. It's, free. it's weird. <laughs> Why would you do that, man? And like, you know, you're ripping people's heads off and doing all this other stuff, which is really kind of unrelatable, but everyone can kind of relate to like having your fingernail ripped off. And it just is really evocative. You don't really see that here, but you know, if you play the game, it's, it's pretty gross. The sound and the audio and everything is pretty nasty. And so where did that leave us? That left us at the point where we needed to solidify the progression of the whole experience. And, I liken kind of Kronos to, you know, like a classic car, you know, if anybody who has had a classic car knows about him, you know, everything will kind of work when you get it, you know, and then like a week later the windows won't roll up and then the sunroof won't close and then like, you know, you, know, you need like a new oil pan and like what happens is that you can never get everything above water, everything, something is always submerged, something is always malfunctioning and that was the case with this. It took us about, I would say, you know, nine months just to get it to a place where we could play through the whole thing from beginning to end with progression and that was really our goal was can we get through it? And it took forever, you know, it kept crashing or you'd fall off and that was gnarly and very disconcerting. And then that took us into the next stage, which was the play testing and kind of iterative process stage of the whole experience. And I liken this very much to being attacked by a shark while you're riding a helicopter under the Golden Gate Bridge. And for all of you who have done it, it's awesome. Or if you haven't done it, you know, whatever, it's, check it out. But as you can see here, it's wrought with peril and it, it tests a lot of your assumptions and it can be very taxing and time consuming. And, and frustrating ultimately. So, you know, we went through that process and we figured out, you know, the people were responding well to this. They, they were falling and dying a lot, but they were responding to the grand spectacle of the whole thing, which we were very happy about. And that opened it up for us to figure out, well, you know, as game developers, you know, we're aware, you know, uh, oftentimes it's, you know, it's not what you add to an experience, it's what you take away from it in order to create uh, the better experience and what to subtract. And that was certainly the case with this sequence, but it, in some respects, we had to find things to add to because we felt like you were still missing things at those later stages, like the sequence where you saw earlier where he grabs you off the belly and holds the hand out, and those dynamic state changes. We really wanted to sell those, so we had to get those in, and there were a lot of eye rolls about that when I suggested to do that because you know, we were already pretty much screwed and seemingly unable to pull this off in the time we had, but we felt if we were going to do it at all, we had to go big. So now that we uh, trimmed the fat and we had everything uh, working, uh, we had a progression, that was time to really turn up the volume and polish this thing out and get it out the door. So that's when all um, 35 members, um, all hands on deck, everybody jumped on board to start uh, polishing this thing, getting it together. So team members like Max Ankar, 
who's the lead um, uh, visual effects artist, uh, you know, did a great job on Kronos. Kerry Gavina, the technical artist uh, that worked, I mean, he, he can tell you some crazy stories about working on Kronos. But, um, you know, they, did, they pulled together, everybody came together. So this is a shot of uh, pre-alpha uh, Kronos. Um, and here's a nice transition to what it actually ended being. So this is the moment that was most exciting for us. We're starting to get the visual effects, the sound, everything's, uh, uh, the, the, new, the new updated animations, the, the, the final character models in place, and the frame rate's becoming more stable. Um, it was really, really, truly an exciting moment for us at this stage. And so at this point, it's pretty much alive, and I think that for us and for me, this was a big, this was a big experience to have it all come together. This is the hardest thing I ever worked on, and uh, it, was a, it was a situation where every day it seemed impossible. Every day people didn't feel they'd be able to do it in time, or people couldn't see the vision, and it was very challenging. It was like looking into a dark abyss, and as game developers, we all know that, and working in a creative medium with time constraints, you, know, you, don't, you can't see the end result necessarily, but you operate on that daily faith that if you guys work hard as a team and you try to be as, work as smart as possible, you'll be able to pull it off. And that was, you know, that was, it was very rewarding for us. And to work on something like this was really why I got into games. It was to work on cool things that I was excited about and passionate about with really talented people. And uh, to me, it was very satisfying, you know, professionally, emotionally, personally, in order to work on this and pull it off and to see it all the way in the end. And I remember, you know, having to set this up for a year and a half, I went through this and I played it after we got all the, the VO in and, and everything. And I remember playing through the whole thing and just really being blown away in the end when, you know, stabbing him in the forehead and he's like pleading with you not to kill him. And I actually felt bad, you know, which was weird because if anyone's like the Wizard of Oz on this, it's me because I set the whole thing up over the last year and a half. But I actually felt that we had achieved what we set out to achieve, which was delivering on the, the believability and the spectacle and selling the experience. Uh, for me, it was uh, kind of like a unique experience to be able to work on this uh, because um, I kind of had um, sort of like I was able to step back. I wasn't actually doing the day-to-day -day animation on the character, but I was able to sort of supervise and see it born all the way from that, you know, God of War II Cyclops uh, previous animation to the Gray Box Man to each iteration, and I, and I could really see this character growing and slowly coming to life. So um, I just, you know... Uh, I was, I'm very grateful that I had that opportunity to kind of have that, uh, that perspective on, on, this, on this sequence. And we're wrapping up now, but I'll just, we'll just jump into an outro clip, and this is kind of how it ends. And so lastly, I just wanted to give a, a lot of thanks and credits to everyone who couldn't be here that worked on this. Like I said, it was a massive team effort. And these are just the, you know, this is a list of everyone that worked on it directly. And we just wanted to thank them personally. And then if you like money watchings, mansions, and cars like we do, and you, wanna, you like what you see, we're hiring. You know, so you can check us out at the Career Pavilion if you're interested. Um, you know, check us out. Come on down and uh, join the team. If that's something we have for future projects we need help with. And then... Lastly, if you want to get in contact with us, if you have questions about any of the stuff that we've done, uh, this is our contact information. And uh, yeah, it was great. We don't unfortunately have time for questions. I think we ran the full schedule. But you can meet us outside after the meeting if you have any questions and you'd like to talk about it with us. Uh, please remember to fill out your speaker feedback forms. And let me make sure I got everything else. Uh, yeah, that's it. That's it. All right, thanks a lot, Thank guys. you so we much for coming, it. guys. Thank you very much.